M S W Media. The rule of law is not just some lawyer's turn of phrase. It is the very foundation of our democracy. The essence of the rule of law is that like cases are treated alike. That there not be one rule for Democrats and another for Republicans, one rule for the powerful, another for the powerless, one rule for the rich and another for the poor, or different rules depending upon one's race or ethnicity. To serve as Attorney General at this critical time is a calling I am honored and eager to answer. So yeah, now it's clean up on aisle 45 time. And for a long while yet, it is going to be clean up on aisle 45. Hey, everybody, welcome to episode 125 of Clean Up on Aisle 45. It is Wednesday, June 14th, and we have a lot of big cleanup happening this week. I'm your host, Allison Gill. And I'm Pete Strzok. And because we record the show on Monday and you're listening to it on Wednesday, you're living in a post-federal arraignment time. And we're in a pre-arraignment time here, but by the time you hear this, the former president will have been arraigned in federal court on 37 counts. Now, before we get to that, we have a lot of other news to cover today, including an update on the E. Jean Carroll case, new evidence that DOJ is prosecuting Eric Prince and Project Veritas, potentially, in terms of using training operatives to infiltrate the DNC and other Democratic entities in the 2020 election. And finally, some news about the federal prosecution of one Congressman George Santos. Yeah, I almost like completely forgot he's also been federally indicted on multiple counts that are pretty serious. <laughs> Um, plus, we have some new Jim Jordan investigations, dun dun dun, and uh, the House Ethics Committee has quietly reopened their investigation into Matt Gates. But first, we need to thank our new patrons, patrons you make this show work. So thanks to SVM, Tony Long, Tiffany J, Joanna, Derek Sullivan, Larry Zappadarini, Levi Barnett, Amy Barth, Christine Brown, Joan Panzella, Jane Lord and Kelly, Lori Keenan Watts, Sheridan Perkins, Anonicus. Mystery Sage, Shenanigans in AZ, Andrew Richter, and Ty B. You guys, seriously, thank you. You make this show run. Uh, if you want to kick us some support, uh, you can do that by going to patreon.com slash aisle45pod, A-I-S-L-E-4-5-P-O-D. You can name yourself whatever you want, like they do in pub trivia, and we will read it on the air. <laughs> so thanks very much, Pete. Let's. Uh, we can't not talk about this arraignment. We break a, a bunch of stuff technically uh, apart and we do deep dives over on the Jack podcast, but I really wanted to get your thoughts uh, on what came out in this indictment, particularly the photos of boxes in ballrooms and bathrooms. And it's just, um, I didn't have as close of a relationship to classified material for as long as you did, um, or as close as you did. And so I really wanted to get your thoughts on, 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 on what you read in the indictment. Yeah, I mean, look, it gives me a case of the hives and not just the fact that Trump had not one, but two half-assed little chandeliers in his shitter somewhere at Mar-a-Lago, the little itty bitty <laughs> chandelier over the commode itself. Um, it, it was more like just, again, you've got anybody who handled classified information on a regular basis. Like, look, I, was, I had a clearance in the army, but literally I could count on one hand the number of times I had access to classified information. But on the bureau... Daily basis, had access to classified. And, and listeners, I mean, if you had a clearance, you know this. If you're in the intel community, you know this. But I, Allison, I got to tell you, like, if I had, FBI headquarters sits across Pennsylvania Avenue from the Department of Justice, literally like, you know, not even a block, walk across the street and you're there at DOJ. If I wanted to take a top secret document from the FBI to DOJ for a meeting, I would have to show up at work. I open the combination safe lock on the door, outer door to the office, open that up, put my phone off to the side because I can't carry it inside the skiff, go inside, turn off the alarm, go into my office, 
open another safe where the classified document is. If I wanted to take that to DOJ, I'd have to take that document to some control officer who would sit there and generate a receipt that had a particular uh, number on it and number of copies on it, attach it to the document, go back to my office, get a special bag to put it into that then would zipper shut and the big heavy duty lock that would close, lock the bag that the document was in, stick the pocket in, stick the key in my pocket, the pocket, by the way, next to my sidearm that I was wearing on the trip across. So now I've got my bag, my sidearm, the lock bag. To do this, though, before I do it, I have to have a courier card where somebody in security division gives me a bunch of training, informs me about what I have to do if I'm going to be carrying classified information around outside of SCIF. With all that in hand, I then walk that 100 feet across Pennsylvania Avenue to DOJ. I then go into DOJ. I go to the person again in the SCIF with all these sort of same, the locks and everything else, give them this document that they then have to sign for. And then after we're done with the meeting, I have to then go back across the street, take it to the person, give them the form that I delivered the document to. So there's this huge process when it comes to classified information and the way that you have to protect it. And of course, the way you have you, you have to protect it that way because of all the, sin, the sources and methods, whether it's some human source that the CIA recruited, you know, and Just some- Thousands s- of hours of work that go right. into that. Yeah. And it, it, to recruit them and then they're providing information. If they're found out, you know, somebody the CIA is recruited that's working in Iran or working in China or working in Russia, if they're found out, they're going to get arrested and more likely than not executed. So it's like serious business. Or maybe it's from super, some super like high speed sensor on a satellite overhead. Or maybe it's some super high speed, really sensitive way that the NSA has figured out how to intercept some sort of signals intelligence. But all of this takes an extraordinary amount of time and money. And then once you do it, certainly on the human side, if that information gets out, you put somebody's literally put their life at risk. And then we're sitting and we see these photographs of a ballroom at Mar-a-Lago stacked, you know, several boxes high. We look at Trump's crapper with this, like this, you know, I tweeted, I joked about, you know, my grandparents put like a copy of Reader's Digest on the in the toilet. Like if you need a reading material, you can pull that out, you know, and like the power of, you know, the whatever the word of the day or in, pays to enhance your word power, whatever the hell that thing was. But, you know, instead you got all this stuff <laughs> with a like a half-assed curtain on a tension rod and behind that curtain in the tub looks like there are more boxes stacked. So the question is like, on the one hand, just the cognitive sort of dissonance between spending 20, 25 years handling classified information so carefully and then seeing it sort of strewn all over Mar-a-Lago with boxes knocked over. And and we're not talking one or two, Allison, we're talking, and this surprised me too. They charged 31 different documents. I anticipated Mm -hmm. there might be three or four and within a count you'd have several documents. No, they, they went through 31 counts, 20 of those, 21 of those, sorry, at the top secret level, which again, top secret information by definition if disclosed could re- without authorization could reasonably be expected to cause exceptionally grave damage to national security and so you have 21 documents individual counts of top secret information and then the final thing that really sort of sticks out at me is how many of those relate to the department of defense to military plans to military capabilities mm-hmm. there's a whole range of classified information but this set there was a really heavy DOD military flavor to it. I don't know if that's because Trump selected stuff that was largely DOD or prosecutors. Look, if if I'm arguing this case to a jury, many of whom in Southern Florida might have some sympathies towards Donald Trump, if I can sit there as a prosecutor and sit there to the jury and say, look, many of you have served in the military. Many of you have brothers, sisters, parents, children who serve in the military. This information literally potentially put their lives at risk. I mean, that makes a very compelling, you know, it, it, so many people, you know, if you go out one or two levels removed from most anybody in the United States, you know somebody who's been in the military. So I, I think it helps drive home the point of why this information was so sensitive and why, and, and make it almost easier to understand the harm. If it, I mean, look, if a war plan, if the, if the military capabilities of a particular adversary were disclosed, it's pretty easy to explain how that would put a, a serviceman or woman's life in danger. So it just, it, it's appalling. I'm surprised at the number. And I, I don't know what your, what, what are your, like, what were your first thoughts? Well, that, all of that 
Yes. And then given the fact that we know that um, there's been Chinese spies that have been arrested at Mm Mar-a-Lago, there have been, uh, you know, and it's not it's not just, you know, Becky getting married. (laughs) There's been people down there trying to spy on us um, that have been um, incarcerated, arrested. So that also went through my head, not just the throngs of people that that information could have been exposed to, but the specific types of people we know have been found uh, to be in Mar-a-Lago. So that also uh, crossed my mind. Also, it occurred to me, none of this would have happened if <laughs> they didn't play musical boxes. I think, you know, I mean, the, the 31 document counts are there to to underlie the and underpin the seriousness of the obstruction charges and to give a foundation for it. Because if you remember, Bill Barr wrote a whole memo saying the reason that we couldn't prosecute Donald Trump for what happened in volume two of the Mueller report was because there was no underlying crime. So that's totally untrue. But the Department of Justice has completely removed any and all doubt in this particular case that there is an underlying crime, and that is retention of national defense information under the Espionage Act. Um, we, I, also, something else I noticed, there were things that weren't in here. The the pool draining incident was not in here. The um, uh, dissemination was not charged. Even the two documents he waved around that we have him on an audio tape for, I don't think are part of this this collection of 31 um, documents. I don't even know if we were able to find them or get them back or where they are. That's also something that's frightening. There's still a... 30 boxes of missing stuff um, that aren't accounted for, at least not in this indictment. But I don't think, I think that those instances of him waving stuff around were simply there to show and prove his intent and that he knew he had classified material and that other people shouldn't be able to see it. uh, Yet it was strewn about carelessly uh, in his uh, residence down there and in other places in the, in the resort, I guess resort is a doing a lot of heavy lifting there. If you want to resort to go there, I guess. Um, uh, but those are the things that that stuck out to me um, a lot, is that all this is about, all he had to do was return the stuff to the National Archives. And then he had a second chance with a subpoena where he could have handed everything over uh, properly. And he he failed to do that again. And now we're in the position we're in because, like I said, they played musical boxes, obstructed justice and, and fucked with law enforcement and, and the Department of Justice on this. Uh, it could have been avoided. I think if he had handed everything in, we wouldn't see charges. Yeah, I think that's right. And like of the 31 documents, none of them came from the batch of material that he voluntarily gave back to the National Archives. Every right. single one of the 31 documents either were given in response to the subpoena from DOJ or found during the search warrant. So again, I I agree with you. This is absolutely a criminal disaster of his own making. And he's unrepentant. I think that was the, you know, we won't probably spare everybody a dramatic reading of the conversations that they put in there. But this taper is essentially, he's like, you know, see as president, I could have declassified it. Now I can't, you know, but this is still a secret. And then you get his like staffer like, yeah, (laughs) now we have a problem. Trump saying, hmm, Isn't that interesting? No, asshole. Isn't that illegal? You know, yeah, (laughs) yeah, it sure is interesting, but it's, it's, it's avoidable. It somehow is just the perfect coda for Trump, the presidency, Trump, the man, a a self-inflicted wound. I, and I truly believe had he not run for president, I also, you know, all the things, all this spotlight on past bad behavior, alleged past illegal behavior, all of that simply because he decided to seize we wanted the spotlight and, you know, charged into this unrepentant. And now, you know, crows are coming home to roost. Yeah. And I imagine, uh, like I said, people listening to this will have already watched the arraignment. I imagine it will be as uneventful as the arraignment in New York was. Um, There's tens of Trump supporters. (laughs) Quick Uh, (laughs) and boring, much like his Two minutes with Stormy Daniels, right? Oh, hey. Hey, hey. hey. Sorry, it's a family show. It's a family show. Is it? Are we a you family gotta, show? You got to wait for the bonus episode for the, for the, yeah. blue, for the blue news. For the, for the super blue news, at least. Um, <laughs> but yeah, he, I think he'll be in and out. He's going to get um, photographed, mugshot, fingerprinted. The mugshot's not going to be released to the public. He's not going to have to sit in a cell. I don't think he's going to have to have a public defender because two of his attorneys, Halligan and Kais, are both barred. Right in Florida, which means they are members of the bar in Florida, not like barred from being there. Um, and so I think that that will work in their favor. They just haven't filed that paperwork yet. 
Um, now, it'd be interesting if, if they tried to and were told no or if they refused. You know, that would that would be fun. That'd be an interesting time. We'd have to see what happens there. Um, and it's going to be interesting to see how Judge Aileen Cannon handles this case. God, don't get me started. <laughs> um, so there's just a lot. Um, but I will say, in the end, if we get a conviction, there's absolutely no way anyone can accuse Jack Smith of showing favor to the Department of Justice or, you know, I mean, bends, bending over backwards here to, to make sure that Donald has a fair, a fair trial. Yeah, 100%. Um, not that Look, he wouldn't any- anyway, but now that you've got a Trump judge in Florida where he lives, like, it's like, come on. Um, and it's, it's so open and shut that a couple of Republicans are coming around. Dim Scott a little bit creeping over. Um, Nikki Haley a little bit being like, oh, this, this could be bad. So, I mean, we'll see how it goes. I don't think there's going to be a huge violent uprising. I think the violent uprisings are now going to be contained to the one off sort of, you know, the stuff we saw in, at, you know, at the FBI headquarters with the shooting and the, the guy who rammed his car into the stanchion poles at the White House. I think the CNN bomber, I think that's the kind of stuff we're, we're mostly going to see from now on. And I think a lot in a large part that has to do with the deterrence of the Department of Justice handing out 17, 14, 12, 11 year, four year, three year sentences to people who attacked the Capitol on January 6th. Yeah, that's absolutely right. I mean, I, again, I think that for Miami, from federal to state to local law enforcement, they're going to have the area very well secured. The courthouse itself is going to be very well secured. I think they're prepared to, like anybody who might be inclined towards violence, I think they're going to be ready for it. I'm I'm absolutely with you. My concern is not there at Miami. My concern is just like, you know, this kind of somebody who clearly had issues, you know, two or three days, I think, after the search warrant at Mar-a-Lago in the middle of Ohio in Cincinnati, he gets an AR-15 and a nail gun because he thinks the nail gun will breach, you know, ballistic uh, glass and it doesn't, as he found out. But it, it's not the threat right there at the courthouse. It's any crazed supporter. And again, most most Americans are law, ab- law abiding. Most Americans are not, you know, whatever their political persuasion, they're not going to pick up arms and try and attack somebody. But if you have like one one hundredth of one percent of thirty million people. Th- that's still a ton of people, and so my worries. I'm, I'm exactly with you. I, I worry about what happens for some kook in Phoenix or some nut in Bismarck, North Dakota, decides that he's going to stick it to the feds, and he decides to do something stupid, and so everybody's got to be on guard. And you know, Trump is signaling all the you know the nonsense he was talking about Jack Smith naming. Uh, Smith's wife by name. I mean, this is all everybody knows what that's for. You know, it increases the spam, but it also increases the threats. And so, you know, it's it's unfortunate. It's expected. I would hope the judge would issue or be inclined to issue some sort of gag order that you know you can't go you know bad mouthing the prosecutor on social media or in radio interviews. I don't. I think the initial appearance is for a magistrate judge, not Judge Cannon tomorrow. But you know, I've got real. I I have a it's lot judge of concerns Goodman. about Judge Cannon, right? And I don't think there's going to be a, a gag order even from this particular judge. There wasn't in New York, although there were some warnings. Um, and and then they were there were some video conferences about what it means that the evidence is protected. Do you understand? Sign here 800 times. We might see something like that. Um, but those usually come after you've done something wrong. They don't generally pre-gag somebody like that. Um, plus, he's running for president. There's all these First Amendment considerations and da 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 da. So I don't think. We'll see that. He's definitely not going to be remanded. He's going to be out on bail. Yep. Um, uh, Walt Nada, I wonder if he can afford his. I, uh, well, but he, you know, I just look at Walt Nada and I see somebody who's like almost like, you know, a Navy vet, spent 20 years. He worked in the White House mess forever. Seems to, I, you know, again, who knows the reality? There's no escaping the fact that the indictment clearly paints a compelling picture that Nada was conspiring with Trump to obstruct justice. No question about it, as alleged. But having said that, I can also absolutely see the case where this poor person, you know, just honored to be working at the White House, honored to be working for various presidents, gets towards the end of his career where he can retire, honored to be asked by Trump to stay on and continue working for him, just trying to do a good job and gets drawn in to a criminal conspiracy that, you know, he, who knows his state of mind. I mean, it, it is hard to read the indictment and think he's was suckered into it. But I do wonder to the extent how much he was getting good legal advice about the true extent of his legal exposure 
and whether or not he should have gotten earlier advice to, you know what, let's sit down with DOJ. Did you lie? If you lied, let's come clean. Let's make a deal. Because now he is facing serious federal felonies. He is facing serious jail time. And it just strikes me as he is not, you know, some conniving master, criminal mastermind. Yeah. And, and unlike I, Donald, he actually has to go to prison. And it, right. And it just yes. Sort of, yes. 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 Right. Donald might have to go to prison, but, you know, there's other considerations there because of Secret Service stuff. But yeah, um, it, it also just goes toward... Uh, how much disdain and and nonchalance uh, and misunderstanding, uh, lack of understanding of the service that Donald Trump has toward people who are in the military and veterans uh, and people we've lost. So that it's just it's kind of just all wrapped up. And, and uh, yeah, I'm I, I'm interested to know more about Walt Nada's story as well and how he ended up in this position and what kind of advice he got and his because lawyers being paid for by Trump and I wouldn't be surprised if his bail was paid for by Trump we'll see we'll see what ends up happening yeah and it'll be interesting I mean it's one thing if you have an attorney who's representing you in the course of a grand jury investigation now he's been indicted in you know in federal court that's representation of a whole different Color. And I wouldn't be surprised if we saw a motion uh, for uh, waiving a conflict of interest about about uh, his Stanley. Right. Right. And then who's going to like, you know, to pick somebody up? It isn't just like, oh, you know, you're doing it in build the Trump org and hope that they pay for it. I mean, I can see somebody who's like, if you want a serious, competent defense attorney, that's going to cost, you know, potentially a lot of money. And if Trump is going to pay for it, given Trump's reputation of not paying, I can see, you know, folks demanding not for Trump. For now, to demanding a significant retainer just to uh, take on that representation, yeah. but you know, and at this point, at this point, they don't need him as a cooperator, so it's not like flipping is going to be save him. You know what I mean? So it's, but I mean that you know he could come in with some amazing proffer that we don't know about and and might be able to to work out a little bit better of a deal. But you know, it's be- it's better to do these things before you get, <laughs> before you get indicted. So, uh, and and Andy explained to me, he's like, we sit him down and we say, look. Uh, we'll do a deal with you but if you lie to us you're extra fucked right right um don't if you're not going to give us everything then don't give us anything i mean they basically say that you know he's like we, we, we prep them pretty well for that and we give them the like you're in a lot of trouble but i guess i don't know well uh, the backstory will be interesting when and if we hear it um all right well uh we're going to take a quick break we'll be right back we've got this eric prince thing to talk about so stick around we'll be right back <laughs> All right, welcome back. We got a few more patrons to thank. JLB Esposito, Aaron Thompson, Lisa Rue, Lisa Stamey, Jeremy Henry, Mandy Horsell or Horsell, Nancy Hayes, Nick Martin, Gina Schiffer, Sarah Carroll, Carrie Olson, Lisa Newman, Aaron Grice, and Stacy M. McMacken. Thank all of you so much for your support. Again, as Allison said, you are truly the ones who make it possible for all of this to be on the air where you're able to listen to it. So, you know, thank you. This is just extraordinary and tremendous and really, really appreciate your support. So (laughs) while everybody's been busy talking about Trump and the Trump indictment and what it means, a big story that flew under the radar is that there has been new overt investigative action from DOJ regarding a story that we covered previously in the show way back in... uh, uh, at least a year or two ago, about Eric Prince training, of all things, political operatives to infiltrate the DNC and other Democratic entities ahead of the 2020 elections. So this reporting is from Kara Scannell at CNN, and she reports that prosecutors have subpoenaed Richard Seddon, who is a former British intelligence official, as well as Susan Gore, who's a Republican donor and an heiress to the Gore-Tex fortune, as part of this investigation. This is all coming out of a 2021 New York Times article that, you know, shockingly enough, talking and citing interviews and documents detailing what the Times called, quote, an undercover operation by conservatives to infiltrate progressive groups, political campaigns, and the offices of Democratic as well as moderate Republican elected officials during the 2020 election cycle. Now, apparently one of the subpoenas, which was sent in the past two weeks, so really recently, sought documents and communications from January 2018 all the way through the present, so five and a half years, involving numerous limited liability companies and individuals, including Gore, Seddon, but also Eric Prince, and, drumroll, James O'Keefe, the former head of Project Veritas. So, <laughs> I, you know, it, it's really interesting to see both the length 
of the documents that they requested and the people that they're going after. Because, you know, these are, you know, yes, Gore was a funder, but when you talk about Seddon and Prince and O'Keefe, those were allegedly people, at least according to the New York Times reporting, who were on the ground um, providing this training and conducting this activity. According to the reporting, prosecutors are looking into whether any campaign finance laws were violated. It's being handled out of the Public Corruption Unit of the U.S. Attorney's Office in Washington, D.C. Now, is that different from the pin at the DOJ at Maine Justice? Um, so they'll they'll work in conjunction with each other, right? So there is a the the public integrity section at uh, DOJ is the headquarters entity at the in oh, criminal division, right. and they will work hand in glove with public corruption prosecutors at various U.S. attorneys' offices. Because every it, every U.S. attorney's office has a public corruption. Yeah, team. and in particular, obviously Washington D.C. the <laughs> U.S. attorney's <laughs> office because you have Congress because you have everybody who the lobbyists and everybody interacting with Congress. They have a really supercharged. Uh, public corruption group. So again, these are these are heavy hitters. These are people who have done significant public corruption cases before. Um, been a lot of movement. Gore retained Nicholas Gravante, who is same attorney who repped Weisselberg in the Trump Organization case. Sedna has retained Robert Driscoll, a well-known defense attorney. And that uh, Matthew Schwartz, <laughs> a lawyer for Pence, said, quote, as far as we know, there are no federal criminal investigations involving my client whatsoever, which is That's always, Prince's, you know, just you know, always, always the last to know is not a place you want to be in a federal criminal investigative context. So do you know who Schwartz is? Have you ever, I, do you know that I guy? I don't, I don't know the background yeah. on Schwartz. Do you have any info on him? N- nope. I, I haven't heard of that particular guy. So maybe, maybe Eric Prince with all of his billions should find a lawyer who's who knows about the investigation involving his client because it's in the subpoena that <laughs> his name is in the subpoena. And I guess O'Keefe recently had to step down from Project yep. Veritas. They had a falling right? out and there's not a lot of love lost between O'Keefe and, and PV. So, you yeah. know, we'll see where that goes too. Uh, yeah. And, and his, they asked his attorney too, like, uh, what's going on? And he's like, you need to talk to Project Veritas. And Project Veritas is like, you need to, we don't fucking care. So <laughs> like, <laughs> right. not, a, not us. You're pointing at the other guy, right? <laughs> Yeah. And, you know, and they, Allison, what's crazy is like, you know, so Seddon, Seddon, the former British intelligence officer, worked with Prince, got money back at the end of 2018, was literally training out in Wyoming, I think, training activists to infiltrate political groups with like secret super intelligence officer training. And according to the New York Times, Seddon recruited former operatives from Project Veritas where he previously worked. And this is not just, you know, the, the, in, the stuff that's currently, at least according to the reporting under investigation, is infiltrating the DNC and these, you know, state Democratic and moderate Republican groups. But also in the New York Times reporting, they're the same group of people trained by Seddon, former PV operatives, funded by Gore, were involved and they like leased this multi-million dollar mansion overlooking the Potomac in Georgetown. And they were trying to go out using these like, you know, honey traps to lure members of the deep state. You know, they were targeting FBI agents because they were convinced they were going to uncover malfeasance and, you know, targeting of Trump on the part of the FBI. And they even went so far as to try and target then National Security Advisor H.R. McMaster. There's some reporting that they got his schedule from some unknown source in the White House, knew that he liked to frequent a particular restaurant in Georgetown, and were sending operatives in there to try and 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 like you know get him to spill you know information about his dislike or, or mistrust or say negative things about Trump. So it's like this really was like, it Philomena's because I love that place. <laughs> I don't. I think it was actually Cafe Milano if I remember correctly, which is also <laughs> good. You know, but it's just this is like sleazy, horrible stuff. I can't imagine. Consider, if you will, Mm. the response from the Republicans, if George Soros was paying for some, I don't know, pick a rabbit out of the hat, former bunch of British or Australian intelligence officers to go out to a ranch outside of San Francisco and train operatives to infiltrate Mar-a-Lago. I mean, they'd bump into all the Russians and Chinese operatives trying to infiltrate Mar-a-Lago. Don't get me wrong. They got mad about a letter written by former IC folks saying that, you know, the Russia thing was not a hoax. But they weren't at a ranch training. And also, by the way, some of these Republicans made massive donations to Democratic candidates to gain access to their parties and soirees and even the the debate in vegas and and so yeah so they're mad about a letter that was written by former intelligence officers saying that the russia the russia issue is real 
at, but they weren't at a at a ranch training. Hen- yeah, it's like like some goddamn PLO training center in the Baca Valley, right? You're out in the middle of Wyoming <laughs> with like you know pull up bars and you know little obstacle <laughs> courses and pop up with your AK-47 and shoot. I mean, I, I just don't want you know. Here's a mock up of a bar. Go in and seduce this person to get into the inner workings of the. It, it's just sleazy it's beyond the pale i don't know if they're going to get like you know if their campaign vi- you know, finance violations here given the fact that they were making bogus donations to gain access but it's just such tawdry awful potentially illegal behavior and you know i'm glad to see doj's it's, it's investigating worse than watergate it. yeah it's worse it's worse yeah. than watergate and it worked <laughs> right about- and the point is it worked yeah. if you go back and read that new york times reporting they were trying they in fact did infiltrate these organizations, they did have people showing up at meetings who they believed were donors, who they believed, you know, were were in areas not open to the public. So not only was this occurring, but it had its intended, at least one of the intended goals of what they were trying to do, in that it got them access into these Democrat and moderate Republican groups that they would not have ordinarily had access to as a general member of the public. Man. Well, it's being uh, federally investigated, and subpoenas have gone out in as recently as the last two weeks. So, and and Eric Prince's name and Gore's name and Seddon's name are all over him. So it'll be interesting to see what they what they can find um, when they investigate that. All right, we've got still more news to get to, but we have to take another quick break. Everybody, stick around. We'll be right back. All right, welcome back. Punchbowl News has reporting that the House Ethics Committee has quietly reopened its investigation into Matt Gates. Now, at first, the House Ethics Committee deferred to the Department of Justice's investigation into sex trafficking. But since DOJ didn't charge that, the committee is picking it back up. The committee hasn't decided yet whether it will move forward with a special investigative summary. But if it does that, the move would be publicly disclosed. The probe is apparently about the same allegations that DOJ investigated, along with allegations about drugs and bragging about sexual conquest to other members. So I don't know the amount of appetite on the part of the Republican-controlled uh, committee and subcommittee, but certainly, you know, Gates is a polarizing figure regardless of party, and it'll be interesting to see whether or not they decide to take this on. Well, Gates has been making Speaker McCarthy's life hard. And and here here here's my beans, okay? Put some beans on it. Do you remember during the Speaker vote, what was it, 15 ballots, 13 mm-hmm. ballots, something, uh, when there was almost a fist fight on the floor and somebody came up to Gates because he, did, he didn't cast the vote the right way that everybody thought he was going to, and they whispered something in his ear? I think it has something to do with this. You know, you go our way, we're not going to look into you again uh, with what the fucking DOJ was looking at down in Florida. I don't know what happened to that investigation. I, that blows my mind that, you know, uh, that didn't go anywhere, but, um, you, you, you know, there was a deal made there and I think it has to do with this. And I, and now they're reopening it and they're, and it, they're looking into the stuff. I'm all the same stuff, the sex trafficking, the Coke orgies and the Molly and the MDMA, and then showing people naked photos of girls on the house floor and, bragging about your car like all it's that stuff right it's the madison cawthorn type stuff they got rid of him um and i think that they said we can do it to you too i don't that's all again speculation but um but you know with the motivation behind this quiet reopening of this matter but uh look for some potential fireworks in the future i don't think they would have reopened this unless they were intending to go through with something yeah, and unless this is some sort of warning shot, but I think, frankly, if there was any warning, it's oh, already yeah. been given. Be this is not, you know, that that warning, I agree with you, that that warning has already been delivered. This seems like yeah. a, uh, you know, an escalation from that. So we'll see. I mean, yeah. just what. Oh, yeah. We'll see. Let's watch, <laughs> as my dad used to say. All right, next up from Raw Story, in newly filed court papers, and I want to do a little content warning here because there's going to be some graphic sexual stuff. Uh, but the former guy, former President Trump, on Monday, made a fresh push to get the defamation claims against him dismissed by saying his denial that he raped author E. Jean Carroll was truthful. And so he couldn't defame her and that a jury agreed with him. But E. Jean's lawyer, Robbie Kaplan, responded, the jury unanimously found that Donald Trump forcibly inserted his fingers into E. Jean Carroll's vagina and then lied about it, defaming her when he said he didn't know who she was, not that he didn't rape her. 
He never met her at Bergdorf Goodman, he said. That's def- that's defamation. And that she had made the whole thing up as part of a con job or hoax. Again, defamation. She went on to say the jury believed E. Jean Carroll when she testified that Trump sexually abused her. As a result, the jury concluded that Trump knowingly lied about Miss Carroll when he claimed otherwise. So that's what's going on, and that's his latest trying to get trying to get out of this particular. Uh, yeah, this particular unbelievable. Case. Let's let's parse out what rape is or isn't in the in the context of something. What what an absolute sleaze bag. And she was honest in her deposition. She's like, honestly, I couldn't see whether it was his fingers or whether he was penetrating me. And that is why the jury couldn't come to the conclusion that she, that he was raped. It's it, they did find defamation. And so to come back and, yeah, like you said, split hairs about the definition of rape here uh, is it's disgusting. Yeah. And I'm, you know, there's one other thing I saw, like, I think it was sometime today that DOJ is essentially not yet taking a position on whether or not they're going to substitute themselves via Westfall Act for the president in this when they want the courts to decide some questions before they do it. And I, I, I got to tell you, I'm a little, I, I was angry at the time when they made that decision the first time around. And I'm frustrated and angry right now that they won't, like, look, this is clear. They're in, in no reading of the intent of the Westfall Act is this in any way, shape, or form something that the government should be substituting itself for Trump in this behavior? And it's a little ridiculous that, you know, that that issue is still potentially at play. But, you yeah, know, we'll I agree. See what it happens, was Barr but... who made that decision. And I think that the amended complaint on Carol One for the stuff he said during the CNN town hall has given uh, this DOJ the off ramp to, to withdraw their certification or substitution uh, in this case. But he also tried to appeal it, this attorney general. Uh, where he could have not and let it go. Uh, so, you know, maybe he felt he had to make the argument that the previous DOJ did in order to maintain integrity of the DOJ and not to give itself a black eye. But come on, man. So I'm hoping that they that they do the right thing here. And as soon as we get the information about whether they decide on the amended complaint for Carol one, whether or not they're going to sub in for Trump, we'll you know, we'll let you know. And in case you forgot, DOJ has charged George DeVolder Santos on multiple federal felonies, and he's been trying to keep the names of the people who paid his bill a secret. He had until last Friday to appeal the court's ruling to release the names. He got his filing in just right under the wire before the deadline, and in it he claims the shirters would withdraw from serving as his bond supporters if their names were released. Now, in response to that, media organizations had filed a motion to release the names because knowing who is gifting half a million dollars to a congressman, meh, it's kind of in the public interest. Now, Santos argues that he's, quote, basically told the public that they're family members, unquote, who don't exert influence over his work in Congress. Basically, basically, Allison, basically. Oh, Anytime okay. I hear is somebody like George Santos using the, the conditioning word, basically, mostly, pretty much, more or less, kind of, sort of, you know. But then watch, it's it's Tom Fitton. And he's like, yeah, but Tom Fitton. Tom Fitton is my cousin. He, so he is technically like he'll just make up some sort of lie. We, we are, it takes a village. We're all big, basically, family members of each other. So yep. anyway, the filing shows the House Ethics Committee is also trying to get the name from Santos. And in all the, the backdrop to all this, when you look at all those federal uh, charges, if he's convicted, he can he's looking at 20 years. I mean, it's a long time that he's facing. So, you know, these kind of little peepee games that he's playing about, you know, trying to like withhold the names, it, they're not, I, I cannot imagine that the court is going to be amused. We'll see soon enough and we'll see what gets uh, released. But I, I, will, I will go on the record right now and say when you're like basically saying that their family members <laughs> probably means they're not exactly entirely completely family members so we'll mm. we'll see what you know but he's such a long history of telling the truth well that he does and understand. the thing is what makes it helpful is that he is you know the great great nephew of the head of the saudi sovereign wealth fund and so that he, that it really mm-hmm. is family no i'm obviously teasing i mean this is well all that volleyball that he played sort of puts him in a precarious position in you know? the walter Mitty-esque imagination of george santos <laughs> everybody <laughs> everybody is a family member Charles Lindbergh, <laughs> the Rockefellers, the Gettys, the Rothschilds, uh, all family, the all Trumps. family. Trump, the Trumps, we're family, we're high yes, five. Yes, the she's, yeah, it's just, every, it's every family. It's just the Save America pack Kim. that bailed com, me out. Kim.com, my uncle Kim, right? All, <laughs> everybody, right? Yes. God, uh, God. My. All right, just uh, a couple of uh, uh, more quick stories, but again, got to take a break. Everybody will be right back. Mm-hmm. 
And if you're tired of those breaks, you can become a patron and get these ad free. And, uh, you know, little is a buck an episode. And we'll read your name, whatever it is, on the air. That's patreon.com slash aisle45pod. All right. Before we get into what has Jim Jordan's panties in a twist this week, I just want to note that Chuck Grassley today, who, by the way, told reporters he hasn't read the Trump indictment, really, <laughs> has said on the floor that they didn't. he now has 17 audio recordings about Hunter and Joe Biden and Burisma. But what does he actually have? Well, according to Grassley himself, and let me see if I can parse this out. He says he read about the recordings in the redacted part of the 2020 report where a paid informant said a Burisma guy supposedly told him that he recorded conversations in 2015, but he doesn't know if they exist or what was said. Uh, Come on, give me a break. Chuck Chuck Grassley, he probably has like a series of photographs of crop circles from West Dubuque, (laughs) Iowa, with video of 17 little green aliens who came out to, you know, avenge the loss of the five gray aliens two years prior to that. I mean, there there is nothing, if there is a person, I mean, that, that I don't understand that story. I have no expectation that Chuck Grassley's discernment to be able to sort through disinformation created by the Russian intelligence services, if it exists, is there whatsoever. So I, you know, let's hear it. And I'm sure, you know, he suddenly has this information, really, again, that Bill Barr's Department of Justice presumably also had access to. Kept and hidden decided to since 2020. Yeah. Come on, come mm-hmm. on, come on, go, go, right. go get, get to the state fair and have a goddamn corn dog and take some photographs and just <laughs> let this little, go we're getting let, a little bonus episode Pete, we, we are today. let this go let this go chuck <laughs> let it go let it go be a be a dignified elder statesman let stop it stop it stop it all right what's up with uh oh, is it, yeah, yeah what's sorry up with so, jim so nixon men at the washington post say that jim jordan and his allies in congress are demanding documents from in meetings with leading academics who study disinformation Increasing pressure on a group they accuse of colluding with the government and government officials to suppress conservative speech, of course. We've gone after Twitter. We've gone after the government. So now let's turn it on woke academics who are just trying to understand what and how disinformation is working. So Jordan's colleagues and staffers met on Tuesday on Capitol Hill. With a frequent target of right-wing activists, namely University of Washington professor Kate, Dr. Kate Starbird, two weeks after they interviewed Clemson University professors who also track online propaganda. I mean, these this is the University of Washington. This is Clemson University. This is sta- these, these are reputable professional people who have devoted their education and their life's work to trying to understand and track propaganda from government and non-government sources. Last week... Jordan threatened legal action against Stanford University, home of the Stanford Internet Observatory, for not complying fully with his records request. The researchers who have been targeted study the online spread of disinformation, including falsehoods that have been accelerated by former president, now candidate Donald Trump, and other Republican politicians. The pressure is for some researchers, one, to change their approach or even step back, just as disinformation is rising ahead of the 2024 election. Now, Starbird's meeting on Tuesday follows a letter from Jordan in March to the University of Washington Center for an Informed Public, which she co-founded to focus on online disinformation. The letter demanded years of her communications, saying the center may have supported, quote, a censorship regime, unquote, backed by the federal government. Many of the academics who are under the microscope have worked on the most fraught topics, such as claims that fraud cost former President Donald Trump, the 2020 presidential election, conspiracy theories about coronavirus vaccines, and foreign influence campaigns targeting Americans. So, Allison, I can't wrap my head around, I mean, what what sort of pillar of sort of objective professional activity will Jim Jordan not try and attack? Uh, it just it, it boggles my mind that, that people who are recognized experts, people who are recognized nonpartisan actors, people who have led the field in both the research and the publication of their research about these activities now are subject to Republican wrath because guess what? It turns out that some of the largest beneficiaries of this din- disinformation, some of the largest people who are propagating this disinformation – Happened to be Donald Trump and those around him. So burn okay. everything to the ground. You know, Jim Jordan is just, you know, it, it's not enough to F around with with Twitter and Twitter's interactions with the government. Now let's go after leading academic institutions and do the same thing. 
Yeah. And here's the part that interested me. The, the, the day, the, this is, I'm quoting from the post here, the deluge of bad information about disinformation researchers' work also has led to a torrent of digital harassment, threats, and smears. Starbird has long been a target of online harassment, but the campaigns have grown brutal. Even when her colleagues and peers publicly backed her, the abuse took its toll, and she walked away from her Twitter account, which had about 50,000 followers, and cut back on media appearances. Quote, the set of techniques used to harass people online has gotten more sophisticated. Right now, there's a lot of bad actors who are using Freedom of Information Act requests. Huh, you know, you know anything about people. that, Allison? <laughs> hey, no, I haven't been a target of any weird hit pieces or anything over the last five years. No, not at all. And, you know, she had a 50,000 follower uh, account and I have a 650,000 follower account. So um, I'm I'm pretty familiar with um, with these digital troll swarms and the and the, the attacks and the deluges and the threats and the so yeah uh, can confirm um i'm not an ap- i'm not an academic by any means um of course when they use the recording of me saying everything up to the point where i said i'm not an academic they'll go out there and say i claimed i was an academic and i should not be trusted um context it matters but yeah this is um very scary to read i mean this is stanford clemson g like these are, like you said, reputable, she just, like, information to protect the public groups, you know, like, the, the the whole point of this is to make sure that people are getting honest information. And there's a whole group of people out there who want you to get disinformation and want to stop people who are trying to stop you from getting disinformation. Um, I, do you know anything about that with the Russia stuff? I mean, I can't, I can't think of it. Did anybody <laughs> yeah, try just, to take you just, out or... Just a little bit. And I mean, look, the fact of the matter is that when it comes to Russia, like there is so much for Russia riding on the upcoming election. I mean, this is like, if Donald Trump is elected, there's not going to be continuing support anywhere near the same shape or form to Ukraine as exists now. And if Biden is reelected, then you're going to see a continuation and something that is really, really going to put Putin in a terrible spot if he's not already been overthrown by that point in time. But my point is- Russian interest in the outcome of the 2024 U.S. presidential election is far greater than it was in 2020, is far greater than it was in 2016, because truly it is a existential issue for Putin. And so you're going to see- Because accountability is starting to happen. Right. And And they want to cut that off at the pass. And and speaking of which, I mean, there's a time, there's some- reckoning coming. Like when you had all these ex-Twitter executives pulled in front of Congress, I mean, Elon bought Twitter, so I didn't expect to see any sort of like support coming out of Twitter for their appearances. But now, come on, it's like Clemson, Stanford, I'm very interested to see what these academic institutions are going to do to step up to protect their researchers, to protect their employees, to protect the academic freedom and independence of their professors and researchers. And I, you know, I'm curious. I, I don't, you know, I, it, it will be interesting to see. I hope it is robust. I hope you have a coming together of, you know, not just Stanford, Clemson and University of Washington. I hope that you see a broad coalition of reputable academic institutions saying stop and standing up against what is clearly an attempt to intimidate, which has worked, right? It worked. Jim Jordan's mm-hmm. His actions worked. Stepping away from Twitter, cutting back on media appearances. The last thing we need are people who are leading independent researchers and experts in this field to be curtailing their public activities. That's the last thing we need. And they're doing it because of Jim Jordan and his activities and the things that are surrounding that and funding that. And it's just a shame. And I hope that we see a reciprocal defense of this work, you know, coming to their aid. And, you know, time will tell. We'll see what happens. And we will. And we'll keep an eye on it for you, too. And also in the coming weeks here, we're going to keep an eye on a couple of disbarments that are getting close to being Let's finished. Let's go. We got, Let's go. We, we got Eastman. We got, I, I mean, I can't even remember, Jeffrey Clark uh, and, and Rudy Giuliani. There's supposed to be decisions in these cases. Um, uh, we just got a federal judge allowing the, the Clark one to go forward after he tried to stall it forever. But now that's back on uh, full force. And we should be getting imminently any moment now. Of course, that could mean months from now. You know how things go. But uh, in the Rudy and Eastman cases, uh, so uh, in D.C., New York, and California, respectively. So we'll see. Uh, we'll keep you posted on those. Um, but yeah, I predicted in a "Twas the Night Before Christmas" style poem, um, before right before the 2020 election, that they would all be disbarred 
and indicted. So uh, it, it's taken, it's been <laughs> two been and a, a half years. <laughs> <laughs> but I knew that that, I knew that that was going to be the case. So um, we'll just keep an eye on it for you. We'll report that stuff here, all that disbarment uh, joy. Uh, and, you know, by the way, this latest uh, Truth Social post where Trump says he's going to appoint a real special prosecutor a break. to get to the bottom of all this. Just like, you know, the last real special special prosecutor he wanted to appoint was Sidney Powell. So good night, uh, everyone. But um, that is our show. Again, thank you so much for supporting our show. Thank you for listening to the show. It's always free. If you can kick in a buck or two, you can do that uh, on our Patreon, and um, then you'll get them ad-free, and you get to hear, you got a little bit of ranty and a little bit blue from Pete bit, today, but it taste. gets- the, fir- the first taste is free, then first yeah, taste then, is you gotta, free. then you gotta- <laughs> yeah. But that, it, 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 gets, it gets pretty spicy on the weekend uh, bonus episode. You get twice as many episodes if you're a patron. So anyway, thank you so much, uh, and we will see you next week. I've been Allison Gill. And I'm Pete Struck. And this is Clean Up on Aisle 45. Clean Up on Aisle 45 is written, researched, and produced by Allison Gill with editing by Molly Hockey. Our art and logo designer by Joelle Reeder and Moxie Design Studios, and our music is composed and performed by Adam Orr. Clean Up on Aisle 45 is a proud member of the MSW Media Network, a collection of creator-owned podcasts dedicated to news, politics, and justice. For more information, visit mswmedia.com. MSW Media.